That, that, that's good to see. You see, that's good to be able <laughs> to get it confirmed that you are a living person. Good. <laughs> so now I guess we are all here in this virtual room, and it's my great pleasure to introduce our lecturer today, uh, Mike Roberts. Uh, all I know about him comes from his self autobiographical self description on his famous blog. So <laughs> what I am allowed to know is that Michael used to be what we in Soviet Union would have called practical economist. <laughs> but of course, it means slightly different things in Great Britain. So he used to work practically as an economist. Now he retired and he concentrates very much on his famed blog, which is widely cited, widely used by people like me who are interested in Marxist economics, but who are not specialists and who just need an authoritative source to consult on the Marxist views on what is happening recently in world economy and also on the history of world capitalism beginning in 19th, 20th century. I personally cited this blog a lot when I, for example, needed materials to explain to my students the Kondratiev cycles in 19th and, 19th and 20th mm -hmm. century, the cyclic theory. It, it, it was a part of my course on world system theory and then the blog came very nicely. So, and today, Michael is going to treat us to a lecture about the widely used and also widely misunderstood term imperialism, what imperialism should mean economically in our age. We are going to, lis to listen to a presentation which would deal with such important topics in our age of global investment and global trade as, for example, unequal exchange to which degree we still can speak about unequal exchange between the core and the periphery. So the floors, the electronic floors is yours. And I understand that you're supposed to have around 40 minutes or so. And then I'm looking forward to a very fruitful Q&A session. I personally have some questions, in fact, as a amateur Marxist economy lover myself. And I'm sure there would be more questions from elsewhere. So the floor is yours. and. Looking forward to listen to you, please. You can share your PowerPoint, I think. I hope that our host will give the right to share the PowerPoint to the presenter. Well, thank you very much for giving me such a powerful introduction. I feel very excited about myself having heard from you. Um, and, and it's a great uh, pleasure to be able to kick off this second round of the SSN series of talks, which is a brilliant initiative on the part of our Korean colleagues to uh, launch this and bring all these uh, very uh, uh, erudite and powerful lecturers in a series. Uh, so I hope I don't let down the others coming after me uh, with what I do today. But uh, there are, I decided that given the invitation to speak that I would concentrate on some of the work that uh, Myself and uh, Guiglema Kalkadi, uh, Italian Marxist economist, has, uh, we've been working together for some months on looking at the questions of the economics of modern imperialism. And those are two words that I would emphasize in that title, the economics and the modern. So um, we're, we don't go back over, the, over some of the other definitions or the, the wider areas of imperialism uh, in our of work and our dis discussion, uh, but uh, concentrate on what we see as the important economic foundations of modern imperialism. And as you say, I'm now going to share some graphs to show this. And I hope that's possible. Should be, yep, here we go. And so if I go. So we start off um, with our primary point that we want to do in this paper, which is to talk about modern imperialism as primarily an economic mechanism and not a political mechanism. Its basic aim is not a political dominance, in our view, imperialism, but economic exploitation. And economic exploitation is the means to achieve all the other things that flow uh, from imperialist domination. But, it, uh, but that imperialist domination, the political superstructure and the, and the forms that is taken over 
centuries in some ways, but also in, at least within the uh, uh, mode of production of capitalism, in, also in several forms, um, is not the cause or the explanation of imperialism, but we should look at the economic foundations first. I mean, we just remember imperialism in the, as it were, uh, as being colonial rule. I've just dug up a, a map of Africa um, after the Berlin Conference of 1884, and you can see that the African colonies were divided up amongst the imperialist powers in a patchwork quilt uh, to provide direct uh, domination with no uh, political institutions on the behalf, behalf of the people living there, uh, but purely directly controlled by the imperialist colonial powers. Um, later on, of course, colonialism has given way to, yes, still controlled politically through uh, imperialistic friendly governments or even coups to get rid of anti-imperialist governments around the world to ensure that governments on the whole support the uh, interests and, the, and aims of the imperialist bloc. But uh, you can draw a much more important way of looking at the economic foundations of imperialist power by looking at the, the key economic categories that are involved in imperialism. Tony Norfield and uh, Marxist economist in Britain has come forward with a fairly simple index, which I brought forward to you today, just to give you an indication of the sort of the divisions and breakdowns that exist in, amongst imperialist powers and others. And Tony uh, take, adds GDP, FDI, bank uh, uh, size, uh, FX transactions, and of course, military power into one long index. And you can see on this index that Tony's got that the US is way ahead of anybody else. China appears to be second, but then we get us the usual suspects of imperialist powers following that. But if you strip out some of the political aspects there, the military, and also if you strip out GDP, which is like a measure of the size of the economy rather than whether it has any imperialist intentions, then, then the results are a little different. And that's where we start with our uh, analysis of the nature of modern imperialism at the moment. Um, we want to focus in particular on what we think is the key point about imperialist uh, economic foundations, namely its ability to, of economic exploitation, uh, working through capitalist competition to bring about the, trans the transfer of surplus value from the dominated countries to the imperialist countries in a number of ways. So our focus is on this transfer of surplus value. We think that's a key factor in understanding the nature of uh, the economic nature of modern imperialism. So uh, the long-term appropriation of surplus value by the imperialist countries from the dominated bloc is a key definition of what we have in mind. What we mean then by economic imperialism is the long-term international appropriation of surplus value by the imperialist countries from the dominated countries. And in this appropriation, what matters, what plays a central role is the level of technological development that the imperialist or companies in the imperialist bloc have, and therefore in the imperialist bloc as a whole. So it refers to the appropriation of surplus value by high technology companies from low technology companies in different countries. Because imperialism has most of the high technology companies, then the flows will tend to be from the dominated block in terms of surplus value to the imperialist block. Although there are flows between countries all the time based on this process. So we would define imperialist countries or imperialist block as those with a persistent high number of high technology companies as measured by their overall average, or in Marx's terms, organic composition of capital, the composition of uh, fixed assets relative to uh, the employment in that country and whose average technological development is higher than the national average of other countries. And so they're able to economically dominate on this account. Of course, all countries are stratified at a certain level by that technological composition and uh, uh, their ability to produce a higher level, a higher rate level of productivity of labor. Uh, but we, we will be able to show, we think, a distinct difference between the imperialist bloc 
and the, the, all the other countries which we call the dominated block or dominated countries. Imperialist countries tend to form blocks around themselves. So you could say the US has a block uh, of uh, other, some lesser imperialist countries like Canada and so on. And of course, a whole range of dominated countries like the backyard of Latin America. You could say Franco-German imperialism has a block as well and is able to uh, lead, be the, the, the first in the lead uh, over the other lesser imperialist countries in the Eurozone like Italy and so on in Spain. Um, and able to dominate the, do uh, the Eastern Europe and others uh, from that hierarchy. But so there's a, strat there's a stratification, obviously, within imperialism. But within uh, the, that stratification, there are, two, there are clear blocks. Uh, there is a clear block between the uh, imperialist block, who, uh, yes, the US is both uh, an expropriator of surplus value and expropriator of some surplus value, depending on the re relationship technically they have with other imperialist countries, but the fundamental difference is that imperialist countries are net appropriators of surplus value for long periods due to their persistently higher level of technological efficiency, especially in the high technology areas. So that means that um, we have a view, as far as we can see from the evidence, that we think there is just a number of well-established imperialist powers sitting on the top of the uh, economic pole, if you like, uh, with the vast majority of other companies forced to remain in a peripheral dominated role, paying out much more in surplus value transfers uh, than they receive in surplus transfer values. Uh, in, the, in the way that I've described in the moment, what forms those surplus value transfers take place. And we find, at least from our evidence so far, that there are no such things as sub-imperialist countries. The idea that some countries may be dominated by the, the top imperialist countries, but also act as an imperialist power economically and politically in their region with uh, less well-off or uh, weaker uh, countries around them. Uh, the ar argument being, in a way, that the BRICS, as they used to be called, um, are really sub-imperialist countries. They are dominated by the the, the top imperialist ones, but they also dominate perhaps in their region, uh, other dominated countries. So they have a sub imperialist role. We don't find evidence for this. We don't find that there is sufficient uh, argument to say that sub imperialism exists. There, is, there seems to be a lack of persistent technological superiority in these candidates for sub imperialism and the productivity differentials are not great enough to justify a persistent transfer of sufficient amount of surplus value to regard these countries as being sub-imperialist. And anyway, our logical argument is, we're, you know, if you've got a, ratific a stratification of countries from the top imperialist down to the dominated, in a way, everybody is sub-imperialist because uh, there's a transfer of surplus value in and out. The real issue is to define in the imperialist block is whether there's a persistent, long-term and large transfer of surplus value to them as against other countries. Uh, ways of transferring surplus value. In, first of all, of course, uh, imperialism, has, as Lenin explained way back 100 years ago, the key, one of the key factors of the development of modern imperialism on an economic basis was the export of capital. The investment into the so-called colonial world what is now in shorthand called the global south or the dominated countries with huge amounts of capital investment, setting up companies, means of production, uh, foreign direct uh, flows out, and then also uh, beginning to invest in the financial, financial sectors of these economies with investment in their debt and buying uh, the stock shares and so on, portfolio investment. So that, that's a huge amount of, of uh, transfer of capital done by the imperialist countries, as we'll show. That sets the basis for the return or uh, transfer of surplus value through various methods because of the assets based through the export of capital by the imperialist block. So we get a lot of income flows back, factor income flows, uh, primary income from interest on debt, profit and dividends from equity, even rents from property, and uh, uh, interest also from bank loans and so on. There's a huge income flow, and 
the plus and the minus on that, that net income flow is a very good indicator of the transfer of the amount of transfer of surplus value. So secondary area is seigniorage, uh, a currency which dominates where everybody has to use in international transactions and as a store of value in the FX reserves provides a tremendous uh, opportunity for transfer of, uh, of surplus value for the dominant currency, which of course in uh, 2021 is still the US dollar. So seigniorage is another area in which there's a transfer of surplus value. This is relatively small, but nevertheless is not uh, to be dismissed. And then the other big one, which many people concentrate on, uh, scholars, is the global value chain flows. In other words, transfer pricing within multinationals or between outsourced companies and the uh, monopsony buyer uh, back in the imperialist block. Uh, so it could be just changing the prices within uh, the oil company for exploration, for going downstream towards refining and so on, shifting those prices around so that the profits end up in a certain place, uh, transferred out of the original countries in the dominated block uh, into the headquarters of the imperialist, uh, of the company in the imperialist block. Also through outsourcing, the classic example, of course, is Apple phones, where uh, for the Fox not con con uh, company in China is contracted to sell and produce and sell on to Apple the phones at a contract price, which is really low. Apple sells those into the consumer market internationally at a massively higher uh, price. So there's a huge value added transfer taking place there within multinationals. But according to UNCTAD, that that global value chain flow transfer of surplus value is not the main way in which surplus value is transferred through uh, commodity exchange globally. It's still just comp competition between capitals on the international trading market for goods. It's not true that uh, dominated countries and, dominant, and companies in dominated countries do not compete with imperialist companies on trade. They do over certain, or lots of commodities, they compete. It's not just a question of transferring through. So multinationals don't control all the production going on in dominated countries. Dominated countries have companies that also export and that go onto the, onto the world market to compete. So as a result, uh, there is a process uh, that we can begin to look at the process of what happens in transfers of surplus value in international trade, something which uh, Marx outlined very well in his explanation of the transfer of surplus value between uh, tech more technological companies and weaker technological companies within the, a national economy, but also it applies uh, to international trade. So, um, Let me just go back to the question of capital flows. Here's the first piece of empirical evidence, which shows that foreign investment stock, foreign direct investment stock, not portfolio stock, but the purchase of companies, the control of setting up new factories, greenfield sites, mergers and so on of companies in order to produce things, uh, both in uh, finance, in energy, in property and so on, but also manufacturing, there is absolutely clear that the top, it says G8, this is basically the G7 countries plus Netherlands, has a way, way higher amount of the foreign, direct, foreign direct investment stock um, globally, um, much higher than the possible contenders to be part of the imperialist block or the sub-imperialist block than the BRICS do, for example. So there is a dramatic difference. Now, a lot of that foreign direct, direct investment stock by the G8, as it's defined here, is between the G8. The US invests in Europe, Europe invests in the US, uh, Canada invests in Japan and vice versa. So a high proportion of this is uh, between the imperialist bloc countries, but it's still very, very high. And if you look at the BRICS figure, you can see that that is not particularly high globally uh, relative to that. And even if you strip out the intra-imperialist bloc direct investment, it is still much higher in, uh, uh, in the imperialist block uh, for owning the assets of the world. And then when we get the income based on those assets, 
which the IMF defines as uh, primary income flows. Uh, we can look at the net figures, that's uh, after the flows in and flows out. Uh, down here, I've called the blue line, the blue block is the imperialist block, which we've defined, we will more or less define later on, and the dominated countries here. This is all based uh, at the moment on, we haven't quite defined those for you, but you can see the imperialist block, which is fundamentally the G7 plus a small other group of, com of countries, uh, has a massive inflow, a persistent inflow of primary income, uh, particularly from the 1990s, but even before. And the dominated block doesn't have an inflow of primary income on a net basis. It's a net outflow. Uh, so that is a strong empirical argument for saying that there's a dis distinctive transfer of surplus value uh, from the dominated block to the imperialist block. And if we just look at the share of the total gross primary income produced uh, in, the, in, the, in these factor income universe, as it were, you can see that the US has 24% of the total gross primary income in the world. It, it gets that on a gross basis. And if you look at the countries that come beneath it, you find the usual suspects that will take part, uh, we could consider part of the imperialist block. It also includes Luxembourg and Ireland, which are the tax havens. But if you strip those out, you can see, apart from China, they are all the usual candidates for the imperialist block. And if we look at the uh, big uh, emerge, so-called emerging economies, they really do not get, have much share of total gross primary income. They're not important. They're also RANDs. They're not involved in, really as part of the imperialist block. And if we just look at the income per head, per person, so we take out the population equation in order to look at the uh, primary income per head, again, we get the same phenomenon. Sweden is a imperialist power by any definition on this measure. And then the UK, US, all the usual candidates are here, uh, odd exception of Hungary, which I haven't got time to deal with. But you can see when we get down to the countries, the big population countries around the world, they are basically not making any uh, gains in uh, transfers of surplus value from the rest of the world. They are uh, not involved in this long-term persistent transfer of surplus value that we define as the economic foundation of imperialism. So as I said before, um, about one third of trade, now I wanna look at unequal exchange, which is the basis of the transfer of surplus value in trade. One third of trade is between companies in different countries, it's internal, through affiliates or through outsourcing. But the main way, the main, and that's an important factor, so it can't be ignored, the value chain, but the main way to appropriate surplus value for the imperialist countries from the periphery of the dominated countries is still through what we call unequal exchange in international trade. And unequal exchange is the gain or loss of a surplus value when the producers sell at an internationally determined production price. If the market price on top of that deviates from the international production price, then there can be a further loss and gain of value. But if the market price is more or less the same as the international production price, there is still a gain or loss of surplus value caused by unequal exchange. That's a, a fundamental argument presented by Marx's law of value, which we are want to focus on. Um, and here you can see uh, our various methods by different people to calculate the uh, unequal exchange in international trade. The first one which has been commonly used now is to take the new world input output tables, which allow you to see on the basis of labor value, labor hours, uh, the transfers of value between different sectors of the economy. If you single out the tradable goods sectors and look at it internationally cross border between countries, you can come up with a figure of the transfer of, um, of uh, labor values between one country and another, and it'll be a net value transfer in the export sector. And they, we've got various measures of these. Down there on the bottom there, I uh, highlight the uh, scholars who have been working in this area, Andre Ricci with his unequal exchange in the age of globalization, uh, Lefteris Vidis and Senefi Sakaliki, I've done work on unequal exchange uh, site the so and very recently Sue and Liang have done something which was in this year's ASA. All they show 
a very interesting development, namely the same countries are negative in their labor transfers and the imperialist countries are positive in their labor transfers. The second method, uh, which uh, is more recent, but has been done before, a very new paper come out, but it's not, it's an old idea that you measure the exchange rate differentials or the difference between the current exchange rates as traded in, uh, by commodities in dollars, if you like, at, and then a national currency of each country versus the P, the purchasing power parity price, which uh, you can work out by a basket of goods, apparently, which will give you a dollar price in PPP terms. And the difference between the two for the goods, depending on the current exchange rate, gives you a transfer of value or transfer of goods, to be more exact, uh, but, uh, in, in price terms between the PPP benchmark level and the national market price. And the difference is what is called in this measure unequal exchange. And so you get a transfer of uh, value in dollar terms uh, as a result of the exchange rate differential. Now, while the first one has some validity as being unequal exchange, although we'll come to what we I think is we don't like about that particular approach, the second one really has not much to do with unequal exchange. It's to do with a differential between the, the exchange rates and the PP exchange rate. It's not to do with actually a transfer of surplus value in value terms uh, in the process of trade. Only the third one, which is the one that we've concentrated on, does that. And here we have a position where we use national accounts to measure the transfer of surplus value based on equalizing the national rates of profit to calculate an international production price. And then we can put that international production price against the national production price. And the difference gives us the transfer of value, either negative or surplus. And that is the idea that we have in the work we've done uh, over the last few months or so. Um, so if I could just emphasize the method one, which was the world input output savings to leaving uh, using uh, coming up with movements in, in labor values between countries. It has the advantage of breaking down sectors. So you can go right down into the component parts of the input out tables to look at sectors and see what's happening, where the transfers are taking place between two countries, say in the uh, tech sector or in the uh, energy sector or whatever. So that's a big advantage. Uh, and it does measure labor values, which obviously is relevant to Marxist theory. The disadvantage is, is we see it as a stacking, simultaneous process. There's, there's not, it's, it's not a rolling process to achieve the equalization of production prices over time. It's just looking at the picture and saying, this is the change in labor values. It's not measured in production prices. So we don't have production prices unless we convert it using PPP usually uh, into money terms. So in our view it has a limited uh, uh, explanation or analysis of how to look at unequal exchange and international trade. The second method, as I said, was showing the power of dominant current cur currencies. So there's a big gain for a currency that's hard like the dollar against uh, uh, a weak currency in a dominated country. And that means it could be a transfer of uh, use values because the US dollar owners can buy a lot more goods in the dominated country and the dominated country with a weak currency can buy less goods. So that's an advantage. It's an interesting observation perhaps We'll discuss more of poverty or more of transfer of resources uh, than, but it's not in our view a Marxian, Marxian view of unequal exchange because it's talking about use values, about the ability to buy use values, and it relies on a PPP measure which we haven't got time to discuss, which is really an incompatible idea in value terms because it's trying to bring together a basket of various and va variated goods and cannot really measure. Le uh, labor our values on that basis. So we prefer method three. It's based on Marxist value theory. It brings out very clearly the importance of uh, relative contributions of technology, the organic composition of capital and exploitation, the rate of exploitation. Its disadvantages we found is that the data of course is difficult. Uh, we have to be uh, either not use it or make some assumptions on things like labor share and capital stock. Um, we have been using the Penn World Tables, which is also used by method two, by the way. Uh, and we've used the latest ones, but obviously in the years going back, in the 1950s and 60s, 
the start off of capital stock and labor shares can be very, very uh, dubious indeed. But let me very briefly go through how the third method works, just in case uh, those of you out there are not aware of how Marx saw the question of the transfer of surface value through unequal exchange, whether within uh, an economy, but also internationally. So you can have ICs, the imperialist uh, countries, can have a certain amount of output, and that the uh, organic composition here is much higher, 80 to 420, so they've got much more mechanization here. That's the total value produced. So the rate of profit is the total amount of surplus produced against the total amount invested. So you get a 20% rate, and the rate of exploitation is the total amount of surplus created by the, uh, by the workers being, who get paid amounts. We've got a 100% rate of exploitation. Dominated countries, the rate for the organic composition of capital is lower because they don't have so much mechanization, they rely more on labor, uh, but we have the same rate of exploitation, so we get more value produced, or you can put it another way, it takes uh, dominated countries longer to produce the same amount of goods in labor hours. The rate of profit there is much higher, 60%, uh, although the rate of exploitation is the same, because the organic composition of capital is different. Now, international competition takes place on the world markets to sell, compete for goods, and the argument that we present, the Marxian argument, is that that tends towards an average rate of profit. So we get an average rate of profit by totalizing all the surplus value against the advanced capital of the two entities, and we get a rate of profit which is 40%. So whereas it, in the various uh, block it's 20%, in the dominating block it was 60%, after international trade and equalization, the average is 40%. So the capitalists in the dominated country uh, produced 160 in value out of their workers, capitalists produced 120, but given that the rate of pro average rate of profit is 20, what happens is that there's a transfer of value from the dominated countries to the uh, imperialist countries through the process of international trade uh, because of the equalization of the rate of profit. And as a result, we get, we get the same amount of production, like 280, you know, 280 before, but now it's been redistributed. So the imperialist countries gain 20 in value terms and the dominated countries lose 20 in value terms. Such is the foundation of the argument of unequal exchange from a Marxian point of view, rather than the other two methods that we've described. Uh, so this is the one that we have time to do some empirical work on. I'll quickly, briefly go through the how you compute it. Uh, we look at the national accounts from the Penwell tables. We work out what the capital stock consumed is in annual production. We work out what the surplus value is. In this case, we use capital stock against the rate of return as provided by the Penn World tables. And then we get also the position for the value of labor power V as a reciprocal of those two items. Then we adjust for the export sectors using the IMF direction of trade. So we get the we get a, a output in the export sector, the export output as C plus V plus S. So to see the advantage of this system, it's not just a total amount. We've actually broken it down in value terms and we've exposed the class nature of this output between uh, uh, profit for, the cap for capital and that what that paid uh, to labor. So thus we get a national price, if you like, for the export trade with another country. When we equalize the rate of profit between these two countries, there are various ways of doing that, which we won't go into. The result is we can have an international production price, and that means we can now compare the international production price with the national market price and see whether there's a transfer of value as we just described before. And this is what we find. We find uh, this transfer of surplus value from the dominated block, which is basically, we're using G20 here. We use the G20 countries, not the whole universe, which we might do later, but we use just the G20 countries. In the G20, there are 19 countries, plus the European Union. So there's 19 countries, eight of them we consider part of the imperialist block, which is basically the G7 plus Australia. And uh, the dominated block is the other 11 countries, which are the major uh, countries that you should imagine in the G20, the largest ones, the BRICS plus many others, uh, to make up what we consider the dominated block. And we find over that period, there is a 
negative transfer on the way we described it uh, through unequal exchange, which reaches in the 1990s to now to $450 billion a year in constant prices. That's what we find in absolute dollar terms in constant prices. Uh, if we took look at that as a percentage of the GDP of both the imperialist and dominated bloc, it's about 1% of GDP per year or 10% of the export uh, trade between the dominated bloc and the imperialist bloc. So on the left hand side, we've got the uh, uh, annual output for the transfer on, on a GDP basis and then on a bilateral trade export basis. So every year, there's a at least within the G20, there's a transfer of surplus value from the dominated bloc to the imperialist bloc just through international trade, leaving aside the other things that we've just described before. So it sounds small, but actually quite a lot. If you think about the growth rate of the dominated bloc being about four or five percent a year max over the last 20, 25 years, then a sizable proportion of that is being lost through a transfer of value, which otherwise should have been uh, in their hands as a production for capital. But it's a transfer of value or surplus value between one capitalist block and another capitalist block. So the workers are not involved in this process of transfer. This is a transfer of competition between two blocks of capitals. If we just can quickly compare the other methods, Ritchie finds that uh, the transfer of surplus value on his labor values method is about 1.9% uh, of gross value added or 9% of exports. Liang Su, more recently, just this year, reckon it, uh, it's about 1.4% of GDP is the transfer of value labor value terms. As I say, we find if we extrapolated our G20 to a wider universe, then it's about 1.3% of uh, GDP and uh, something like 13% of exports. We find if we accumulate all the transfers that have taken place since uh, uh, 1960, we have $9 trillion worth in constant prices being transferred from the dominated block through trade to the imperialist block. Hickel, Sullivan, Zoom, Kawala, who have just come up with a, the exchange rate currency idea in a new paper only this last uh, week or so, they find a massively higher figure of 2.2 trillion in 2018 or 7% of GDP. And over since 1960, a transfer of $62 trillion since 1960 in constant prices. I think, we've, we've, I think because the exchange rate method, I think will exaggerate this result. And again, it's not value, uh, transfer of surplus value, it's a transfer of goods in money terms, if, or resources in money terms, if you like, uh, and therefore is not comparable in our view. But in addition to the surplus value transfer through international trade, remind ourselves that we do have primary income transfers. And in 2017, that was worth about $600 billion, another 1.4% of GDP. On top of that, we have a bit of seigniorage, which I mentioned before, which is about $70 billion. And then if you also uh, consider um, the uh, value chain pricing within companies and outsourcing, if that's a third, it's probably another uh, two or three hundred billion dollars a year. So by the time you've added all this together, you're getting close to three percent of GDP in value terms being transferred from the dominated block to the imperialist block every year. That's a sizable hit to the ability of the tom dominated block to grow, to expand and to raise living standards because so much of it has been transferred uh, to the imperialist block. So imperialism is definitely some important damaging effects upon the prospects for the dominated bloc. Why do they get that transfer? Well, as I said before, theoretically, it is because uh, the imperialist countries have a higher organic composition of capital and therefore can get a higher labor productivity than the peripheral dominated blocs. Even with the rise of China, we can empirically show that's the case. The dominated bloc's technical composition is only 25% of the imperialist bloc uh, as we are now at the moment. So it's still way, way behind. And you see, it looks high, but this is up. This is just 25% up here. So the technical composition of the imperialist block is way higher. So that while that continues, there will be a transfer of surplus value in international trade and competition. 
And we have broken, because we've got the advantage of if we, the method we've used, we can break down the relative contributions of a higher organic composition of capital or a higher surplus rate of surplus value. And we find that in trade between imperialist countries and the dominated countries, the relative contribution of the organic composition of capital, the technical superiority, if you like, of the imperialist countries is the main factor. In fact, way back in the early days, uh, it's as much as nearly 90% of the reason for the transfer of surplus value. That's declined because the uh, dominated countries, particularly China, have increased their organic compositions of capital over that period. And also the differences in the rate of surplus value uh, have altered somewhat that the rate of surplus value is actually risen in the imperialist countries so that they're, they're getting a bit more of a transfer from that point of view. But where we have uh, the picture is that it's the main one. Uh, we can, the main reason for the transfer of surplus value through unequal exchange in international trade is the technological superiority of the imperialist bloc as signified by their organic composition of capital being higher on the pole. Now, other people have argued, other scholars have argued that the reason for the transfer is not a higher organic composition of capital, but super exploitation. By this, it is meant that in the dominated block, wages are forced below the actual value of labor power. And that as a result, there's a, a, a much increased level of uh, surplus value going into the hands of the multinationals and ending up as being the main reason for the transfer of surplus value. We'll make a couple of points about this. First of all, what we, we don't think that's the main reason. It's sure super exploitation exists and wages are forced below the level of, of value of labor power in that particular country. It expresses the huge low levels of poverty that we've seen and have taken place in the discussions. But the, the lower technology countries, or the LTCs in this, usually have a lower organic composition of capital and therefore the rate of profit is going to be higher as we saw in the unequal exchange. And so what happens is that the lower technology countries are forced, their capitals, capitalists are forced to compete against the higher technology companies and countries. And one of the ways they can do it and try to compete more effectively is by driving down the wages of the workers in their countries below the level of the value of labor power that may exist in those countries. And we know all about the sweatshops and so on. But I would remind everybody that everywhere in the world, there is super exploitation. Uh, I, I can go read the, uh, the media today and see the soup kitchens and food banks that we have in the UK. There's a whole layer of people who are uh, getting wages below the barest level of the value of labor power, which would be on the average. But the point is, the value of labor power is not an international value of labor power. There is no international wage. There is different values of labor power depending on the social circumstances in those national countries. So to talk about super exploitation existing on an international level and explaining the transfer of surplus value on that basis is misunderstanding the nature of super exploitation and also the value of labor power. There is no average, an international average of the value of labor power. Each country has its own value of labor power and given the technologically determined and necessary surplus favor, the national values of labor power and the rate of surplus value fluctuate according to the power struggle between the two fundamental classes in each country. So specific features play. What matters is the rate of surplus value, not the super exploitation, but the overall rate of surplus value between countries relative to some international average rate uh, of surplus value. And that's where we get this equalization process where surplus value comes in. So no, we're not, we wouldn't deny that super exploitation exists. We do deny that it is the main reason for the transfer of surplus value internationally, which is often argued by many scholars. In fact, wage levels in the dominated countries are still on average no more than 20% of the levels in the imperialist countries. And most of that gap is due to China, but it's the rate of exploitation that matters here. And as we show in this graph here, we can see that the rate of exploitation in uh, relative to the advanced countries has uh, been falling really until the re recent period. So it, if super exploitation was a key factor, we would expect to see a very sharp rise in the rate of exploitation, but also we would expect to see uh, wages 
continuing to fall, being pressed down, and that has not been the case in the last 15 uh, to 20 years. And a point made by another scholar, Sam King, recently is if even if there is super exploitation, and that is the main reason for a sh big increase in the rate of surplus value in the dominated countries, it still has to be transferred. So it still requires an international trade process which brings about the transfer of value through unequal exchange. It doesn't change that in any way. In fact, I could go through it in detail, which I'm not going to now, uh, of how super exploitation fits into Marx's unequal exchange theory. All it does is change the ratio of the rate of exploitation as a result of driving down the rate of uh, driving down wages below the value of labor power. And that, so it just increases the amount of surplus value, not only that the imperialist bloc gets through a trade transformation, uh, through transformation of surplus value from trade, but also the dominated bloc gets an increase in surplus value through super exploitation. Both sets of capitals gain from super exploitation, but the imperialist countries gain through the trade process itself, not just without trade. Otherwise, that would all remain with the uh, capitals in the likes of India, South Africa, and so on. Finally, I want to deal with uh, China, a very important country that we must always single out now, it seems to me, to understand what's going on. And I think I just want to make the point that some people argue that China has got a huge trade surplus with the imperialist countries, uh, and therefore that must be different, and therefore doesn't have any uh, loss of surplus value through the trade process. Well, that's not the case. In fact, quite the opposite. Uh, because of China's faster growth and because of its huge increase in exports, it actually uh, delivers an even larger amount of transfer of surplus value to the imperialist countries and others. And you can see on the graph on here on the uh, right, the dotted line shows the size of China's exports with the imperialist countries, as we defined, rising up to nearly $900 billion a year. And at the same time, we find that the unequal transfer through trade uh, is it reached $650 billion so it's each year. So it's, it's, it's increasing alongside the tide of trade. Trade is not a, it's a compensation in the sense of producing uh, revenues for China, but actually increases the transfer of surplus value to the imperialist countries. The more trade, more unequal exchange. Uh, so let me summarize. Um, our arguments are as follows, that um, the productivity of labor is key to the transfer of surplus value between the imperialist countries and the periphery. There are two major causes of unequal exchange between the imperialist dominated countries, technological superiority and the rate of exploitation. Emphasizing one or the other, like the super exploitation people do, will be wrong. The result depends on the ratio between the rates of surplus value and the ratio of the organic composition of capital, how that works out for each country in order to judge which is the main contributor towards unequal exchange. There is unequal exchange, whatever happens, but it could vary according to these two factors. Um, and what we're saying now is that there's still things we haven't dealt with in, uh, uh, in this paper. And uh, I know that people who are listening to watching this now have made some points already about this. And I'd just like to emphasize that this only deals with a fairly narrow part of the process of imperialism and its economic domination. As far as we can see, there's a prima facie case for saying there are no sub-imperialist countries, but we're gonna do some more work. We're gonna check unequal exchange and primary income transfers between the dominated bloc countries to see whether there's any particular differences that we can find there. And we need to break down the income flows a bit more into interest, dividends, remittances and so on, which is important. Some countries have big workers remittances, which obviously could distort the figures, but uh, we're not convinced that that will make a big difference, but it's worth checking. And we need to break down the capital flows to see what's happening in the portfolio, uh, investment, securities, equity, bank loans between the imperialist and dominated bloc. All this is perfectly possible. It just takes time uh, and we haven't done that yet. And finally, we'd like to expand our study beyond the G20 which was a expedient way of looking at the figures fairly quickly. And we can do that now that we have a fairly clear method in mind to achieve that and expand that to a whole range of other countries. So our main conclusions are these. One, the evidence shows that imperialism is still the uh, inherent feature of modern capitalism. 
capitalism, the international system mirrors its national system, a system of exploitation. And this is the exploitation of less developed economies by more developed ones. The imperialist countries of the 20th century, as described, you might say, by Lenin in 1915, 16, are unchanged. It's the same bunch. It's the same usual suspects. As far as we can see, nobody has really joined the imperialist bloc that weren't in the imperialist bloc 100 years ago. Perhaps we could discuss that, but we don't see that there is any particular country that's achieved that. And that includes China. We do not see China on these measures as an imperialist country, which some people are. In our view, it is not an imperialist country. In fact, it is uh, providing a huge transfer of surplus value through its trade uh, levels to the imperialist bloc. And the transfer of surplus value by unequal exchange in international trade is mainly due to the technological superiority of companies in the imperialist core. Not entirely, but mainly due to that. And the transfer of surplus value from the dominated bloc to the imperialist core is rising in dollar terms and as a share of GDP. So the main point we'd finish on, on share is that um, nothing has changed. We still have the imperialist bloc. We still have the dominated bloc. And this, the point is that while imperialism continues to exist, which of course is while capitalism continues to exist, then there is no prospect of the so-called dominated countries or these periphery of the emerging economies becoming modern advanced economies, ending poverty and moving them to the living standards that we see such as they are in the imperialist bloc. Imperialism is a major obstacle to the improvement of the human condition. Well, I guess that was a closing statement and it, it works very well, exactly like such. So thank you very much for a very, very edifying, very useful presentation, which makes a number of points which are both important and maybe in some circles are controversial. In South Korea, for example, now there are discussions on academic popular levels on to which degree China should count as an imperialist. And of course, we have a pretty long term discussion since the late 1990s about possible sub imperialist status of South Korea itself. Yeah. On which point I have a question, but it will come later. So I have many questions to our presenter, but before I ask my questions, I would like to ask the people the floor is open for the debates now. Are there any questions? And what I think we should do is that you either just speak or write your question in the chat field so that I would voice it for you. And as a sort of service to the people, for example, who may feel that they're more comfortable asking questions in Korean, you write in chat in Korean, I will try to render it in English. So we can do it this way if necessary. So the floor is open for debates and are there any questions? I'm sure there will be many, but who will begin? Uh, you can just speak if you have a question or write in the chat chat field, I will then voice it. Any questions? Well, the people are silent. Well, they all agree, don't they, obviously, and it's, it's nothing to argue about. <laughs> Oh, no, no, no. There is a <laughs> lot of things to argue about. And in fact, I do have lots of questions to you. But well, since ah, Sebe raised hand, please, uh, please, can you either maybe you speak yourself? Or would you like? Yes, um, mm -hmm. my, my name is Mame Fusebe. Um, I'm actually from South African Federation of Trade Unions. Oh, um, good. you are joining us from South Africa. Yes. Great. So, um, the, I mean, I, I'm very much interested in the whole discussion, I mean, on China and its role, you know, um, in, in the world economy, because, I mean, we have assumed uh, until now, and I think, you know, I, I want discussions on that to say, how do we then define imperialism and what is it that China does which is not imperialist? especially if you look at the role that is increasingly playing in countries like South Africa, but I think the same argument applies to big part of the colonial world, not just in Africa and perhaps in Latin America and so on, 
where you know it exhibits all the features of imperialist relation um, with these countries. I, I just want more elaboration on that. Other than that, I think it was a very brilliant um, exposition, and I, I, I hope that uh, the link and the recording will be shared, and we can engage more um, in some of the discussion that has been raised. So I guess, Michael, it's time to respond. If you wish, uh, I could take a few more, but if, you, if we only have one at the moment. Um, so I, I think uh, Sebi's argument is that uh, he finds it difficult to believe that China cannot be regarded as an imperialist country. There are lots of things to say about this. I mean, we know that China is a dictatorial authoritarian regime, uh, that it is providing a lot of loans and lending and uh, debt financing for many countries, particularly in Africa uh, and around Latin America, uh, not just through the Belt and Road Initiative, which is for Central Asia mainly, but also in parts of Asia, but for, at least for the last couple of decades has been plowing loans and so on. There's a lot of discussion about whether this is in, in, in the same formation, it's the same meaning as an imperialist bloc's investment into uh, building assets and providing loans and re reaping the debt interest on that as the imperialist bloc has done for the last uh, hundred years, if you like, in the ex-colonial world. Is China following that policy again? Well, uh, there, are, there are a number of things we haven't got had time to discuss about the nature of that uh, loan financing, the way China does it, whether it does it on the basis of profit, whether it's doing it on the basis of resource extraction, whether it's doing on the basis of building soft diplomacy, all these are factors you could say they could apply to an imperialist block. But on the whole, the difference between imperialist block investment is to get higher profitability. That is the aim of the imperialist block investment into the ex-colonial world, the global south, or whatever you want to call it. And these countries are exploited for that purpose. And that transfer of value that we've just seen or surplus value is done through the returns on primary income, but also uh, through uh, international trade competition with the dominated bloc. China's form of foreign investment, I think, takes a different form, and that's one thing to think about. To think about, as far as this paper is concerned, what we show is that there isn't a transfer of surplus value from the countries of Africa to China. Well, I haven't shown it in figures, but I could. That is significant, long term, and persistent. It's not there. It's very, very tiny if there's anything at all. We did, I did one uh, calculation which showed that whereas the US takes a huge extraction uh, of surplus value uh, through trade from China on unequal exchange, just unequal exchange, uh, China's extraction of, of surplus value through unequal exchange from other dominated countries is tiny, if not non-existent. So at least on that measure, I do not see China as an imperialist economy, as we've defined it in this paper. You could argue about how you should define it, but not on that measure. Okay, maybe now we have to go to the next question, which was from Arman. Arman's iPhone, but I understand Arman is the name an iPhone doesn't belong to name properly. So the question was, is there an equalization of the global profit rate? Or can we talk more about different profit rates? It would be nice if you would come with a shorter reply. Since now Okay, the like, answer to that is yeah. simple. There are lots of different profit rates and I've measured quite a few of them in my time. Uh, but I would argue that a Marxian theory suggests that there's a tendency to equalize the profit rate, not just within countries, between companies, uh, in, within countries, between companies, but also uh, between countries on the international trade level. And so there is an equalization tendency that takes place. If you were to stop and look at the rate of profit in any country at one point, it would be different from another country. But there is a tendency towards that. I think we've reached a point through imperialism and globalization where we can even start to talk about a world of rate of profit, which gives us an idea of the health of the economy. Uh, but uh, so that's how I wrote that. Thank you very much. And then there comes a comment, come question from Patrick Bond. 
who wrote that he has a few point if there is time on environment, gender, sub-imperialism, ideas which he circulated earlier, which follow yeah. Luxembourg's distinction that Michael is not engaging with yet, including yeah. imperialism's capital, non-capitalist relationship. I wonder if you have something to say about it in brief. Well, let me just say, I think Patrick's points are very valid. I take them on. Obviously our paper does not go into these areas. And if we want a real rounded view of what's going on in imperialism and the destruction of nature, uh, the destruction of the planet is a product of imperialism, which is something we can no longer uh, excuse or ignore. It's not that we have done, but we, it is a vital part of our understanding of the analysis of imperialism. And obviously this paper, which is very, or well, this presentation is very limited in the way that it's trying to look at it. And these areas that Patrick raises are absolutely essential to a follow up. And uh, it's a book, isn't it, to go in this area. And um, we'll attempt to do that because uh, at the moment, Guglielmo Carcadi and I, who is on site, as you possibly can see, uh, we are in process of writing a book uh, from the perspective of value theory to deal with the whole question, not just of imperialism, but the relationship of capitalism to nature, which Patrick raises very important points about. And well, then, then Patrick, would, would there be just a moment to follow up there? Is that okay just to ask one methodological question, which comes yeah. from uh, a Luxembourgist um, approach to what you describe as the fairly narrow heart, which is in the labor theory value, no objection. And I salute you as ever, Michael, for uh, conceptual work and empirical work that's you know, that's leading the world. And, and I, I would only ask that as you think of imperialism, where Luxembourg, uh, in contrast, say to Lenin and Bukhara and Hilferding, really encourages us to think about capitalist and non-capitalist relations. And what that includes would be the destruction of wealth and your methodological approach. You, the two of you comrades are superb on income flows and value transfers and organic composition of capital all of that I, I very much appreciate. I'd love you to expand that, by the way, into problems of overaccumulation, which motivated uh, comrade, uh, you know, many of many comrades to think about imperialism as a spatial fix to the overaccumulation problem. But the specific dilemma I have in reading your work is, on the one hand, I don't think you're tough enough in attacking imperialism for value transfer because you've forgotten unequal ecological exchange, which actually over this period, some of the estimates are in the $80 trillion uh, range. And that's the depletion of natural uh, resources that are non-renewable. Now that's different than a renewable resource, but yeah. particularly it's minerals and fossil fuels. So my, my concern methodologically, comrade, is wealth in the capitalist, non-capitalist relationship is not on your radar screen, but that's where Luxembourg brought imperialism up to date in 1913, partly by studying where I am, Johannesburg, uh, DRC in Namibia. Uh, the second then is if you do those transfers, I disagree and I'm with Sabah on this, if you do the transfers of value in the global value chain sense, yes, China is being exploited and a vast amount of surplus value is then being realized in things like uh, royalties and intellectual property and, and, and all of the ways the imperialist countries will take from China. But China in turn, the global value chain is taking raw materials, which, which are off your radar screen. You have to put them on to see how China is exploiting so many sites in Africa, the way Sabai was, was alleging. And, and those data are there. They are there in the decline in the values of our, our present value of our natural capital stocks, to use a ghastly term with the World Bank. But the little green data book of the World Bank does give us some of those possibilities for estimating those differentials yeah. in, in, and then you do get some imperialism as a category of terribly important, uh, you know, relevance uh, as the Belt and Road Initiative moves into South Africa as our single biggest project uh, in the country is extraction of uh, resources. Uh, our second biggest is a special economic zone, both the China being central. And I think that is a very critical point, even in interests of imperial extractive systems, much less the kind of 
you know, the extreme exploitation we see in places like Zimbabwe, where workers are losing all their, you know, most of the diamond wealth. I'm and afraid they probably have to cut it a little bit <laughs> down, since unfortunately we have a bit limited time. So if you could allow Michael to briefly respond to your it'll, question. It'll be very brief, because much of what Patrick has said, I agree with. It's a whole area that has to be looked at more closely. I know he's done excellent work on it. We, you'd be surprised to hear, or maybe you'd be welcome to hear that uh, Mino and I, that's Katie and I, the next chapter of our book, we've got 10 chapters, we've done eight. The next one is precisely on value and nature and looking at the question of how you uh, weigh up the value of nature's and the destruction of it. As you say, we have some nature stock measures provided by the World Bank. We're looking at that to see whether they can provide relevance to understanding this area. And maybe out of that will come the question that he raises about uh, whether we should include that in the connection with imperialism and also with sub-imperialism. We yeah. are open to that discussion. All I would say is so far as we've got with the unequal exchange approach, there doesn't appear to be a basis for calling China imperialist. Okay, thank you very much for your brief and very, very substantial uh, response. And now we have a question from Son Jin, who writes that he thanks very much for the great talk. And the question is about, about the international prices of production. Uh, your model, according to Sanjin, seems to be similar with Zargiri Emanuel's model of the 1969 of international unequal exchange based on Marxian theory of prices of production. But in the same 1969, Charles Bettelheim criticized Emanuel's model, arguing that the massive inflows of capital from the center to the peripheries, which would be necessary for the international equalization of national rates of profits and the formation of international prices of production in Emanuel's model, would also also result in the acceleration rather than deceleration of the development of the peripheries. What do you think of Bettelheim's criticism of Emmanuel back then in 1969? <laughs> it's, a, it's a big theoretical subject between the narrow UE and the broad UE and what Bettelheim and Emmanuel argued about. Um, I, we presented a model here in that one one of the slides about how we see that transfer taking place, which we think follows basically Marx's transformation model uh, applied to the international scale. And therefore it takes into account different organic composition of capital, mm -hmm. different rates of surplus value, and that the process of, of reproduction, sorry, extended reproduction of that will produce a changes in those figures. All we can, I think I'll always say at this time is that um, if we do that, and we get the empirical results we've got using our model, then we can see that imperialism is restricting the ability of the dominated bloc to join the ranks of the first mm. in terms of technological superiority. So even, you China, are, even China hasn't been, been able to achieve that. So you are more on the side of deceleration than acceleration, <laughs> as far as I could understand. Yeah, well, Marx once said that all countries will, uh, the capitalist countries will, will the later ones will, will follow in, in our own image. Uh, of course, imperialism has shown that's not the case, that they're not exactly. following in the image of the exactly. leading countries. And then we have the follow-up question from Sonjin. One more question is about the validity of the concept of sub-imperialism. As I have previously mentioned, we have lots of debates about it in Korea in yeah. the present. The concept of sub-imperialism seems to be useful for explaining the specific geopolitical dynamics as well as super-exploitation of the laboring population in BRICS countries. Do you think that we can properly explain the Chinese One Belt, One Road initiative or land grabbing in Africa elsewhere without employing the concept of sub-imperialism or Lenin's concept of better imperialism? Uh, do you <laughs> think it, it's useful? It's a similar question to what we've had before. I, I think uh, as far as first on the narrow presentation of the paper, China is not imperialist. Now, uh, uh, Scholars and the comrades here are saying, well, yeah, so that's not enough. What about what China's doing in Africa and Latin America and so on? Surely this demonstrates an imperialist uh, uh, role or activity. I haven't got time to do that. I think there are distinctions between the way that China is operating its foreign direct, direct investment program and uh, debt financing compared to the imperialist countries. I say this once more. The imperialist countries' main objective is to boost the rate of profitability for private capital in the imperialist countries. I don't think that's the objective of China's state-directed control, state enterprise investment process internationally. 
So it's a difference between state bureaucratic capitalism and the sort of oligarchic monopoly capitalism that you have in the orthodox capitalist countries. And I think that makes a difference when we look at the results. And the, and the Very interesting point. And then we have a question from Paul Zarempka. Since the composition of capital is so important, he would ask if Michael has considered C slash V plus S in brackets as more appropriate concept for this work than C slash V, since V is paid labor while V plus C is employment. I'm struggling with this one. I didn't get all, of, all the algebra. <laughs> uh, uh, well, do you want to try and repeat it and have another go? <laughs> just a minute. So the question from Paul, I will try to write it then. Uh, whether you may consider C. I see. Yeah, 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 yeah. I've got it now on the chat line. Yeah, yeah. Uh, C yeah. slash V plus S as yeah. more appropriate concept for this work than C. Over V. Yeah, no, we, I, we don't agree. We don't agree. The reason we don't agree is that it, uh, if you do C over V plus S, although it's a useful concept in some ways in providing the level of productivity created by uh, investment in fixed assets and so on, it, this, it, 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 it hides the exploitation process between S and V. And the most important thing is to recognize the two parts. The big main tendency is a rise in C over V. And this produces a result in S over V as well. But Marx's law of the tendency rate of profit to fall is based on the fact that C over V over the long term and as usual will rise faster than S over V and therefore the rate of profit will fall, not on all occasions. If you use C over V plus S, then you end up with not being able to see that. And you begin to look at the productivity of capital as though capital had productivity rather than the organic composition of capital and the productivity of labor and how much labor gets that from the rate of surplus value. So it's a concept, it's a, more, it's a formula which is useful in some occasions, but on the whole, we, we try to avoid it. When I say we, I mean uh, Mino Carcadium and myself in this. Okay, but let me just make one brief comment. And that is, if you go back to Rosa Luxemburg's Hi, accumulation. <laughs> I, if you go back to Rosa Luxemburg's accumulation of capital, she presented that as the appropriate C over V plus S yeah. as the appropriate description of technology. Um, and I, th I think that's been, that was lost for like 60 years or something like that. And it needs yeah. to be yeah. really seriously reconsidered. In, in my, but there's too much else going on. I, I don't want to bother any no, further no. with this. But you, I think you, you can see where we have a, a, a bit of a worry about it as using it as a main concept for the explanation of the accumulation of capital. But I think it's a discussion which we know we've had before. We can certainly- Yeah, I, I will make some comments next week on this topic on my own. Oh, right. Yes, of course you're on. Yeah, we we'll look forward to that, yeah. And lastly, before my own questions, we are going to have one more follow-up question from Sebei. I joined the call late, but just as a follow-up, how can we not consider part of the transfer of value exploitation of labor for extraction of natural resources by Chinese investment for profitability that is realized largely in China through manufacturing that are integrated into a global supply chain? So it's again question on- Same question, yeah. I, I think Sebe and uh, Patrick are right. We have to look at the question of natural resource extraction and uh, uh, gr land grabbing, as it used to be called in the colonial days, uh, as a, an important part of the process of imperialism. Uh, and all I would say is that it's not just, if China's the one you're looking at, it's not just China, everybody's doing it, particularly the, the, the old imperialist bloc. And I would argue, that's a discussion to come, that the Chinese motivation for that is different from the imperialist bloc's motivation. So it's again about the peculiarities of state bureaucratic capitalism Indeed. versus the orthodox model of capitalist state, I see. So now it looks as if we don't have any more questions from the floor. And since we are over our way, we are behind our time now. So I just, I, I had several questions originally, I will ask only one. And since it's well we, many of us are territorially in korea now it's about south korea well 
how would you assess the peculiarity of South Korean case? Mm. We obviously have a country which on the one hand has productivity levels at around 70% of that of the US. Yeah. On the one hand, 25% of the employed workforce are low paid. On the mm. other hand, companies like Samsung Electronics produce more than 80% of their famous or unfamous smartphones outside of Korea. So we obviously have, have this exploitation of cheaper labor abroad and its contribution yeah. into the value added into the surplus value extraction in the South Korean headquarters of South Korean corporate capital. How would you assess this case? Cannot we still employ the concept of sub-imperialism when we, for example, talk about South Korea's relationship vis-a-vis -vis Bangladesh, Cambodia, or Burma, where, by the way, POSCO was uh, engaged in major gas exploitation projects. We're beginning to say in the UK as well, with Korean cars and manufacturers here, <laughs> <laughs> because the UK has denuded its manufacturing sector. Now we have Korea, India, and everybody else uh, taking over sectors of the manufacturing sector. Does that mean that Korea is a sub-imperialist economy. Uh, I think, well, just like China, which is perhaps a, a, uh, an exception, we'll see, but Korea and Taiwan are on this margin, aren't they? They're, they're a product of in American imperialism's protection, uh, support, uh, along with Japan, to uh, uh, originally to control the area against Russia, and then later on, of course, to provide uh, the base of support now in the modern, in the last 10 years of containment of, of China. So Korea and Taiwan, relatively small economies, and Taiwan particularly, but Korea is not that small, but uh, are perhaps on this borderline from what you want to argue about sub-imperialism. Uh, but all I can say is on the evidence that we've got in terms of the unequally exchange trade transfer of surplus value and on primary income uh, transfers, there's not a significant indication that either Taiwan or Korea are imperialist. But as I said in my final, uh, one of my final slides, then we're going to look at this a little bit more closely to see whether we can discern anything. I see. And well, and very, very shortly, <laughs> the last question about the concept of imperialism. You mainly defined it economically as a system of surplus transfer, basically mainly via the instrument of technical superiority and yeah. price differences. So, but is not it possible to give a more complex definition of imperialism, which would also include the naval area and air control, that is territorial control, the element which we have in say US overseas based empire, which arguably China doesn't have. You have American military bases, more than 160 bases outside of America. And obviously it's something both China and Russia so far lack. So should not this base empire come into the picture? I, I, you're absolutely right. This is only an economic foundations without looking at the superstructure. And one of the big, I mean, the product of the economic foundation of imperialism is that they can have military and political power to support that and maintain it. And an early uh, slide I show from Tony Norfield shows if you add the military power and other things like that to the index of imperialism, the US is just ridiculously high. It, as you know, US military spending is bigger than the rest of the world put together in military spending. So, and then the financial sector of the US is huge compared to most other economies, including the UK and so on. So, when people say that the US is losing its imperialist role, uh, if you measure it on those bases and you bring those factors in as you've done, then it clearly is, is not the case. Okay. And we have two, again, follow up, small follow up questions from Yorgos yeah. P. P. Sinas and Fazlur Rahmat from Yorgos. Thank you for the really nice presentation. The questions, if I may, on the issue of sub imperialism, would like to ask if the issue is expected not to occur in market mechanisms like UA due to the homogenization. Should we search for sub imperialism on other economic fields other than exchange of products? Could you slightly repeat that again? It was. Uh... 
Yeah, uh, if I may, on the issue of sub-imperialism, would like to ask if the issue is expected not to occur in market mechanisms like UE. UE? Yeah. Unequal um, exchange. Yeah. Yes, unequal exchange due to the homogenization. Should we search for sub-imperialism on other economic fields other than exchange yeah. of products? Yeah, well, um, I think the other areas, as, as we've actually put in the paper, was the transfers of uh, value, surplus value from the income earned from capital assets invested and in portfolio assets. That's an important area of primary income flows, which uh, Patrick Bond actually brought me onto many moons ago to look at. So, yes, I think that's an area where we, again, as I said in our further research, we'll look a bit more closely to just see how that works out between different countries as another area. Uh, for transfer of surplus value, apart from unequal exchange in international trade. Yes, and lastly, I guess, from Fazlur Rahmat, if it's a different motivation, can we say that when Farenik, the Ost India company, was liquidated with the mm -hmm. Dutch gift, it's similar with Chinese now? I mean, those not the imperialist. So it's a, obviously a request to compare the early modern Dutch trade imperialism which, with the things which are going now between China and less developed. Well, I, I, I think it's considering the absolutely horrific role, both militarily uh, by the East India Company, the Dutch India Company, East India Company, against the people of uh, Asia uh, during that period of time. I don't think China has been able to establish that sort of role in Africa. Uh, if there's an extraction process going on of natural resources, that's one thing. But we're not in the Belgian Congo where genocide took place because of the Belgian imperialists. Okay, and yes, we have, I hope, I guess, last question from Patrick Bond. Politically, what implications of this new work for anti-imperialist activism? What yeah. multilateral institutions like the WTO keep unequal exchange and unequal ecological exchange going? And can they be disrupted? Yes, well, I mean, I think if, if this paper offers anything on, on the political implications, what it tells us is that uh, we require the complete overthrow of the imperialist economy uh, worldwide if we're to achieve a transformation uh, for the four and a half billion people or more that live in the so-called uh, dominated countries. And that requires an overthrow of the capitalist mode of production because imperialism is the capitalist mode of production in the 21st century uh, as applied to the dominated countries. So that is the fundamental political implication that comes out of this work, how, whether you consider the things about sovereign periods in China and so on that we've discussed. That's the and, overall. well, I guess maybe now it's really going to be the last one. It's my personal curiosity. What do you think about the position of Japan? You probably would assess Japan as a member of imperialist club. Now, do you think that it was also the member 100 years ago when Lenin wrote his seminal treatise. So if Japan wasn't a member then, did Japan join after the World War II? How, how no, I it? think it was a member of the imperialist bloc. Uh, it basically established the capitalist mode of production in a dominant form, as you know, from the 1860s under the Meiji Restoration. So it was become a, a capitalist economy that expanded pretty fast. It gave uh, Russia a bloody nose in the 1904-05 uh, uh, war, demonstrating that it was becoming a more uh, expansive capitalist power with imperialist ambitions. The whole period of the 20th century is the efforts of German, German and Jap Japanese capitalism to establish their position with imperialist uh, ambitions and blocks uh, and domination around the world. They didn't achieve that, unfortunately, for them for capital, uh, but at the expense of hundreds of millions of deaths, never mind. <laughs> Thank you very much. It was yeah. extremely interesting lecture. We all learned a lot and we got lots of what you get, food for thought, lots of things to think, think about. If people are interested now in the chat, you have the address of the YouTube channel where this presentation will be in recorded form accessible. So if you would like to re-watch it once again, you have the address, YouTube address here in the chat section, please refer to this.
And other than this, I would like to extend. I'd just our like to say that I'll be putting the slides onto my Facebook site or my blog so people can get the slides if they want to uh, in a form so that they can always come That's back and complain. Very useful reference. Very useful reference. Again, thank you very much. Would like to extend our deepest gratitude for extremely interesting, edifying lecture with lots of important points to grab. And I wonder if our hosts from Kyonsan University SSK Global Marxism Project would like to have the last word, maybe announce the coming schedule. Okay. Uh, the next lecture is going to be Michael Heinrich. Uh -huh. and, mm -hmm. Very good. and you see the you see now the schedule of the talk, so you can figure out lecture is going to be April 8th. Uh, eight o'clock in the afternoon Korean time. So, uh, so I hope then we will meet again in not so distant future <laughs> today after tomorrow, basically. Michael, thank you very much you for very much. your brilliant lecture. And I hope to see all of you once again. Thank, thank you very you much. much. And then I, I guess we can close our presentation. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank bye -bye. you. Thank you. Thank you. You're a great lecture, Michael. So we leave now. Yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you.